right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for the privilege of being at Bryan College and even greater privilege of interacting with your word. Uh, I pray that you help us today. We want to think your thoughts after you and we recognize that you are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable and we are creaturely and so we'll always struggle to think exactly the way you think, but you are an effective communicator. And we ask that you would open our minds to the scriptures. We come today making this prayer in no way claiming inherent superiority over anyone. If you left any of us to ourselves, uh, we would perish. But we come today boasting in the righteousness of Jesus and the perfection of Jesus and the fact that he bore our penalty and has promised our uh, ability to live with you in heaven. So would you bless us today because of his obedience and because of his death, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to New Testament Lit, and thank you for uh, doing this sign-in thing with a class this size, I would like to try to learn your names, and if I can put a name and a face together, that will help. So you're free over the course of a few days to sit wherever you would like, but I'm going to start putting the chart together so that I can kind of see uh, who's who. So please, if... Uh, uh, in each section, wherever you're sitting, if you would sign in, uh, that would help me. This is New Testament literature and interpretation. And over the course of this semester, we're going to look at the Gospel of John and the Book of Romans and a few other odds and ends. But we're going to work chapter by chapter through those books and so today we're looking at John 1 and parallels in terms of a housekeeping item uh, I hope you've all found the bright space uh, software so that you can interact with this class there is a syllabus there you'll want to look at that but if you'll notice if you log in to bright space there is an attendance quiz each day so there's uh, an attendance quiz. It's linked to the uh, grade book. Today's quiz is attendance quiz one. That quiz will open every day at 8.55, and it will close about 9.05. I think I extended it today, so give you a minute to log in to the website and then take the uh, quiz. And the quiz is very hard. It has one question, I believe. I am here today, so if you're here in this room, uh, you press true, and uh, don't press true if you're not in the room. And I will say in the past, uh, some have felt the temptation of calling their dorm room this room and taking the quiz and saying, I'm here today. But let me tell you, that gets really embarrassing if I ever like take a picture and see who's here and then cross-reference it because I did that one time and for the next two days 30 people came through my office and oh I'm so sorry I will never do that again I'm sorry to name ends up going to the provost let's don't do that if you're here uh, say true if you're not here uh, don't take the quiz for that day and once you've taken the quiz, um, I would ask that you please turn off all electronic devices. And the reason I do that is because the vast majority of people do um, take great notes and uh, are engaged, but there are some people who will uh, use their laptops and surf the internet, and um, that can be distracting to the people who are in front. Um, so. If you would uh, turn off your electronic devices uh, after you take the attendance quiz. Now, here's some advice that I would give you before we start. 
in terms of uh, how to um, thrive in this class. Um, and uh, my advice is this. One, come to class. You'll be amazed at how well you'll do in college if you come to class. Uh, it's kind of like a job. You'll be amazed how happy your employer will be if you show up and are on time. It's kind of weird how that works. So uh, you will thrive in this class if you come to class. And I encourage you to do the homework and I encourage you to do it in groups. Um, so if three or four or five or ten of you want to meet in the same room, talk about the passage together, type up one homework and turn it in, that's great. Just put all your names on it and when I grade one, I'll give every person that exact same grade. It's a great way to thrive uh, in this class. I will say that some people in the past have been tempted to like just add their name, not go to a group and just add their name. Some people have been tempted to turn in previous homeworks. Um, and I'll just ask you this, did you know that you can open up any document and see how long the person worked on it and who authored the document? Did you know that you have access to that? Is there a moral behind that story? Uh, so don't be tempted to turn in someone else's work. Uh, it will be embarrassing. So just don't do it. Just uh, work in groups uh, together. Put all the names and turn, turn it in together. Yes, tell me your name. My name is Katie. I'm one of the bio advisors. Oh, Nova. Yes. Is there a maximum size you can do? There is not. Uh, I, I only ask that if you do group work that you are physically in the same place when you do the work. So don't say, well, you do the first three and I'll do the second and do it by email. That doesn't count as a group. If you're in the same room and you're together working through, then you can put all your names on the people who are in uh, that group, and I encourage you to do that. It uh, is a way to have a regular time to do the homework, and it's more fun that way, uh, I would think. Um, I would also suggest that you learn the memory verses in Romans, and um, just fixing something in the recording right now, if that if you don't mind. Um, uh, there we go. First day of class, we always have uh, uh, a little bit of technological glitches. I hope your cl classes are going well uh, so far and you're settling in. I always in really enjoy the first, uh, first few classes. There we go. Um, learn the memory verse, but start now. Um, it's hard to memorize 14 or 15 verses if you wait till two days before the deadline. My mind doesn't work that way. And it is a percentage of your final grade, so you want to um, start working on that. Uh, now you're free to use any um, good translation of the Bible. Uh, read the two textbooks. Uh, that's a pledged reading, so there are no book reviews. You're just saying, I, I have done that. And then uh, if anyone comments in class, if you make a comment in class, uh, like Nova has made a comment in class, well, he earned an extra credit point 
today for his comments. So if you speak up in class uh, any day, you get a point, uh, an extra credit point for that. So it's a way to thrive uh, in the class. And um, not today, but uh, I've found it very helpful to do what I call ask it basket questions. And so in a class this big, um, you might want to ask a question and feel a little afraid to ask it. Well, if you write it down and put your name uh, on the back and turn it in, I'll give you a point uh, for asking a question. And some of you may know that I have a YouTube channel and sometimes I do videos on those ask it basket questions. So if you submit a good question uh, and I use it, uh, I, w I won't use your name, but um, I'll know your name from the question. If you do that, then I'll give you an extra credit uh, point for that day. Are there any questions? Yes, tell me your name. Uh, my YouTube channel is Biblical Theology Today. Yes, tell me your name. Ellie. Ellie. Is there read them by the end? Uh, they're too short and they're great <coughs> reads, so you shouldn't have uh, any trouble. Jacob. Um, if it's a good question, I'll give you a point. Um, whether I do it or not, uh, I'll, I'll do as many as I can, but so, sometimes I get a lot of questions, so there's a backlog. Uh, but if, if it's a good question, and it does help me communicate in a class this big, I want, want to hear from you. Uh, I want this not just to be a lecture. Yes, tell me your name. Uh, Zachary. Zachary. Yes, I'll give you, if it's, if it's a good question, if it's a good question, absolutely. All right, any other questions? Nova. I just wanted to comment on the comment that you just made. The videos you put on Brightspace, are those on our YouTube channel? Uh, they are. So you're going to have to have those same videos? Yeah, so I will put a link in Brightspace. Uh, I'm recording the lecture uh, today. The lectures are automatically recorded, so you can get them on the Google Drive. Um, my recordings are a little bit better just because the equipment's a little better. And so uh, you can watch either of them. Uh, if you have an excused absence and you want the attendance points, you can watch the one on the Google Drive or you can watch the one that I post. Yes, tell me, I should, oh. Tell me your name, it's gonna take me a second. Jazz. Jazz. Oh my goodness, that shows how slow my mind is, Jess. I'm sorry, I could not pull up your name. Yeah. Um, going back to the memory research, you said you did two presentations. Remember the research you were on Brightspace? Yes. Um, you did two presentations. Don't use the, like, paraf the wild paraphrases, uh, but any traditional translation uh, is going to be a good translation so you can use any of those. And I do have a very literal um, explanatory translation. You're welcome to use the one that I did, but you don't have to use that one. Uh, Nova? It does not have to be in English, but if you do it in uh, foreign language, your native tongue, uh, just bring the printout to me so that I can follow along. Some people have uh, done it in foreign language. It is hard to, if you've ever memorized something in foreign language, that is really, 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 really hard. But yes, I, I've allowed people to do that before and been very impressed when, when they have done it. Yes, Jacob. Um, I didn't see the excuse in the work. Is that kind of a translation? Uh, it's a modern translation, so absolutely. Uh, all right.
Well, what we're going to talk about today is John 1. We're going to take two days to look at John chapter 1. And what we're going to talk about mainly is John 1 and the idea of the Trinity. You may have heard before someone say, oh, the Trinity isn't a doctrine that's in the Bible. Uh, Trinity is a made-up word uh, centuries after and we're going to look at that idea in terms of John 1. We're going to also look at what I like to call metanarratival connections in the Bible. Uh, if you're not familiar with the word metanarrative, that's usually the story behind the story. If you've ever watched a film and you're like halfway through the film and you realize, oh, this is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, Okay, that's a meta narrative where there's a, a story behind the story, and you realize that what you're seeing is actually interacting with a bigger story in the background. And the Bible uh, uses the word typology for that, um, and a more modern literary word would be um, meta narrative or intertextual. Uh, associations, but they're all saying the same thing, that there's an interaction in the Bible with a bigger story, and we're going to look at that. One of the things we're going to look at a little bit today and a lot uh, on Friday is the idea of these pairs in the Bible where you have a, a person who comes and then you have this second figure who comes and does more things, and so that's true of Moses and Joshua. Uh, Elijah and Elisha are two prophets, and um, Elijah's kind of the uh, super prophet, and then Elisha is the super prophet 2.0. And so um, these pairs, and I would appreciate if you would close the computers uh, there in the back, I would appreciate that. And we're going to look at uh, John the Baptist and Jesus uh, in many ways are kind of a new Elijah and a new Elisha. What we'll look at tomorrow probably is uh, Jesus as the new tabernacle. So what I want to try to argue is that there's a connection in God's word between John 1 and Genesis 1. There's a connection in God's word between John 1 and Genesis 1. And in fact, that connection uh, drives some of how we understand John 1. This is a, a wonderful diagram that I've used in many of my classes by Chris Harrison, Bible Viz, um, I guess that's BibleViz.com. But what this is, is he went through the entire Bible, and any time there's a passage, and then a later allusion to that passage, he just connected them with lines. And you can see how every story is connecting with other stories in the text. And you can see the beginning of the Bible is massively connected to the end of the Bible. We're going to explore um, we're going to explore that idea in this class a, a lot. So the advice is if you find something confusing in scripture the best thing you can do is go read the parallels. The parallels will often give you insight. So if you, for example, if you're reading the story of the 5,000 and it talks about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and you notice in the story it says uh, it only counts the men. Uh, there are 5,000 men but it doesn't count the women and children. And perhaps you've heard someone say, oh, there's a toxic patriarchy going on and there's this uh, male-only thing going on and it just shows that the Bible doesn't speak to our age. I don't know if you've ever heard 
questions or comments like that before. But if you look at the parallels, there's a parallel miracle from Elisha. And it's in 2 Kings 4.42. And in that parallel, he takes 20 barley loaves and he feeds 100 men. And so the writer in the New Testament is helping us connect by telling us, hey, these are barley loaves. Hey, there were 5,000 men. Jesus only had one loaf and fed 1,000. Elisha had one loaf and fed five. The parallel, if you look up the parallel often, will help you understand what the text is about. And part of what we're going to do in this class is look at the question, can the Bible stand up to rigorous scrutiny? We live in a pluralistic age. And in that age, people will say, look, you are Christian, but you're only Christian because you live in America. And if you went to university in another part of the world with a different religion, you would have a class, and the class would be telling you, hey, their book is the best. So can the Bible stand up to all comers? Can it stand up to rigorous study? And part of the argument that I want to try to make to you, you're the jury, I'm the, I'm the lawyer, uh, part of the argument I want to make is that absolutely the Bible can stand up. Uh, there is so much evidence that the Bible is true we're going to look at that together. Now, believe it or not, this is what the first page of the Bible looks like. And that's scary, is it not? Um, you look at that and you think, wow, that is like very foreign looking. It's actually a very beautiful language, and I just want to read it out loud to you so you can hear what it sounds like. This is the first five verses of the Hebrew Bible. All three of the world's monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, will uh, affirm that this writing is true. Uh, this is what it sounds like. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim va et haaretz va haaretz hayita tohu va vohu ve hoshakol pene tehom ve ruach Elohim merachefet al pene hamayim va yomer Elohim yehi or va yehi or ve yar Elohim et haor kitov. Vayavdel Elohim bein haor uvein hahoshek. Vayigra Elohim laor yom. Velahoshek kara layela. Vayhi erev, vayhi voker. Yom ehad. That's a very beautiful language, is it not? Uh, interesting thing about this language is that if we accept. Uh, the claim of the document, it claims to be 3,500 years old. It's within 600 years of being the oldest written anything on planet Earth. That's how old this is. It's so old that it's written and read from right to left. And the theory is that smart people, or maybe everyone, wrote left-handed, somewhere in the past, humanity flipped where the vast majority, and so most languages are written this way today. This is so old, it's, it's still written from right to left. What is the, uh, the oldest would be the Egyptian hieroglyphics in the pyramids. And there's a problem in this document. 
and everyone who's ever read this document is immediately confronted by a problem. It's a grammatical problem. And the problem is centered around word two and word three. And I want to try to explain that to you. So this first verse in the Bible has seven words. Uh, the first word is the word Bereshit. And there's not much controversy about Bereshit. It means in beginning. Um, when you read John 1, you may, might have um, seen that it's beginning the exact same way Genesis 1 is beginning. It's even more so in the original languages. Um, when you compare uh, the Greek of the New Testament with the Greek, with the Hebrew, and then uh, the translation into Greek of the Old Testament, they're exactly the same in those passages. In the beginning, Bereshit. When we come to the second word, bara, there's not much controversy about that word either. That word means he created. He created. In the beginning, he created. It's going to tell us who that it, he is in a moment. But two words uh, into the Hebrew Bible, you get this statement, he created. Now, let me ask you, how many have taken a foreign language? What are some of the foreign languages you've taken? Yes, what's a foreign language? Spanish, very good. Someone else? Uh, Nova. Latin. Latin is very similar uh, to Greek. Uh, Sophia. French, Latin, and Greek. You've done very well uh, on those. Yes, uh, other languages you've taken. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Latin is a great language. And Japanese, oh my goodness, that's one of the hardest uh, languages for a Westerner. Very good. Other languages, jazz. ASL. ASL and Greek, very good. Those of you who've taken a foreign language, have you ever had to memorize something like this? What's that called? It's called a conjugation chart. And in English, we don't really have conjugation charts uh, because our language isn't really that sophisticated. Uh, other languages are a lot more sophisticated than ours. Um, this is Latin, amo, amas, amat, amamas, amates, amat. I love, you love, he, she, or it loves, we love, you love, they love. Conjugation chart. The little bit in green tells you who's doing the action. Uh, if you have studied German, this is the German conjugation chart. I go, you go, he, she, or it goes, we go, you go, they go. <coughs> if you've uh, studied French, this is the French conjugation chart. And see the bits at the ending are changing. It tells you who's doing the action. And the same is true with Spanish. And notice how similar those charts are across these languages. Well, Hebrew has a massive conjugation chart. So all those we just looked at, there are six elements. In the Hebrew conjugation chart, there are all these elements. So in Hebrew, you can differentiate he de did something from she did something. So uh, this is he killed, she killed, you killed if you're a man, you killed if you're a woman, I killed, they killed, you all killed if you're men, you all killed if you're women, we killed. So in Hebrew, the conjugation chart differentiates gender. So there's a different form if you're talking about a man doing something versus a woman doing it. So when we come to the word bara, 
the only thing bara can mean is that there's a person who's choosing to describe himself as a man versus a woman, and there's a person who's choosing to describe himself as a single individual rather than a bunch of individuals. And there's really no debate about that. When you come to the second word of the Bible, monotheism is established. Uh, there's a God. That God is choosing to describe himself in masculine terms, and that God created everything that exists. Not really much debate there. But the problem comes with the third word, when it tells you who that God is. Um, when, you, when you have a verb and you have this little guy that's what tells you the direct object. So if it isn't, you can't say in the beginning he created God. You'd have to put this word before God. So this is, uh, this is describing who the he who created is. And in Hebrew, that's how you do it. You put the subject after the verb. But there's a problem. And you heard me probably when I read it out loud. Did you hear how many times I said Elohim, 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 Elohim in that first uh, bit of the Hebrew Bible? And I want to try to make the argument that you may know more Hebrew than you think you know. Let me see if I can prove that to you. You know those entities at um, the Garden of Eden, keep sinners out. Uh, they're on the Ark of the Covenant. One is called a cherub. What are a bunch of cherubs called in Hebrew? Cherubim, Cherubim right. So you got this little eem on the end there. Uh, sorry. And you know those flaming, fiery, snake-like Creatures in Isaiah 6, one's called a seraph. What are a bunch of them called? Seraphim, right. You've got the I am. Oddly enough, in Hebrew, the word seus means horse. What would a bunch of horses be? Susim. We probably get the word Susanna, she who's graceful with horses from this word. And oddly enough, in Hebrew, the word dog means fish. So what would a bunch of fishes be in Hebrew? Dogim, right? I could stand here. We go through 10,000 words. I give you the word. You can make the plural by adding im to the end of it. So tell me then the difference between the word Eloah and the word Elohim. Elohim, you heard me say it, is the plural of the word Eloah. And it's actually translated God's at places in the Hebrew Bible in the Second commandment, uh, uh, you will m make lo uh, uh, Elohim aharim. There will not be other gods to you. Elohim is the plural of the word God. Now, as an intelligent reader, you might ask the question then, what would be a very intelligent reader question to ask? Berashid bara Elohim. Yes, tell me your name. David. 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 And the question would be why would the word bara would be singular and then Elohim would be the And there's your riddle. Bara establishes that it's a singular person. And yet, when that singular person is described, that singular person is described 
as a plural entity. In the beginning, he, that is Elohim, he created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, if we wanted to spell it out, we, we could say in the beginning there's this entity that's a he who equally, eternally, absolutely is also a they. And that doctrine, remember in this text written 3,500 years ago, that doctrine, three words into the Hebrew Bible, is established. A view of monotheism that has an undefined plurality within that monotheism. I should know your name, but uh, tell me your name again. So the, Moses only uses the singular of this word a few times in Deuteronomy, but he does use the singular. The vast majority, um, I think it's over 2,000 times, when we have the word God, it's going to be this word. And then there's a related word that's a true singular, El Kana, uh, God, God of jealousy, uses the L singular. And that's the question that as readers we have to ask, is it not? Um, like why, why would Moses, who's wanting the people to be monotheistic people, why would he use a plural word? And I suppose the answer is that God is inspiring him to create this tension. One very good interpreter, B.B. Uh, Warfield, says the Old Testament is like a lavishly furnished room dimly lit. I'm paraphrasing there. And progressive revelation isn't that the room changes, but rather more and more candles come in. So God hid in plain sight a teaching that was only going to make sense when the fullness of revelation came in the person of Jesus and the glorious threeness of God. Uh, uh, but it's there, three words in. And remember, all three of the world's monotheistic Fates believe that Genesis 1 is from God. So which of the world's monotheistic faith believes that God is a unity that includes a plurality? Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. The very first verse in Genesis introduces a grammatical riddle in that the word translated God, Elohim, is really a plural word. It is the singular verb he created which shows that Elohim has to be singular. But the im part, we could look at thousands of words. Im makes words plural. You add im to the end of any word, and it converts it from a singular word to a plural word. And so you have this grammatical tension, three words into the Hebrew Bible. Yes, tell me your name. Sorry? There are about um, 20 times where the verb is plural. Um, and some people will say, oh, Elohim really isn't uh, a singular verb. And I say, well, tell that to Abraham. Because Abraham, when he's talking to Abimelech and says, God made me wander, uh, I think that's in like Genesis 19 toward the end. But that word wander there is plural. And so... Uh, here you've got a native speaker 
uh, intention about how to communicate the action of this glorious entity, Elohim. And that, and that happens about 20 times in the Hebrew Bible where you have that plurality. That's a great question. Thus, the very first words in the Bible introduce a view of God that states that God is a plurality within a unity. Now, when you read John 1, 1, do you realize what he's doing? In the beginning, he, that is Elohim plural, how does God, how does John John says, in the beginning, he's explaining this to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There was real community there. There was real plurality there. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John is saying, you know how the rabbis could never explain that riddle in Genesis 1-1? You know how we always ask, why, why is God being described? John is saying, let me tell you why that's there. In Hebrew, all things is another way of saying heavens and the earth. In the beginning, he, that is this plurality within the unity. All things were made through him, and without him, there was not made anything that was made. John 1, 1 to 5 is the Bible's commentary on Genesis 1, 1 to 5. That's why the same words are appearing. Remember that slide that had all the connections? That connection start in these very first words. The Bible says this, it's the glory of God to conceal things and the glory of kings to search them out. What God has done is hidden his truth in plain sight and he's giving us in his grace the ability to search out these treasures that he's given for us. Now, um, I don't want our time to be just my lecture to you, so questions or follow-up or uh, observations, Nova. There is. Um, I saw someone, Sophia, was it you that had the Nestle Alon, the blue what, Nestle Alon uh, Greek text? Um, yes. So there's a great resource. We have it in the Bible. And just hold that up. This is called the Nestle Alon uh, Greek text. In the back of that text, there's an index. Uh, it's hundreds of pages or dozens and dozens of pages long. And it shows every connection between every passage. And so, and that's just a partial list. Um, I, th I think it would be for me, Project, to say that John is making it interactive. There's a like three minutes or whatever time. Yeah. Uh, and, and the question that becomes is how does that get there? I mean, what we're going to see is. It's not just Genesis 1-1 that does that. It's every single page of the Bible that does that. There's no story we're going to come across that doesn't have this huge backstory there. Uh, other observations or questions? I should know your name, but tell me again. Ellie. Ellie. And it's exactly the same thing. It's God speaking of himself in the plural. And God does that 
uh, many times at the Tower of Babel. He says, uh, let us go down to see. He says it in the call of Isaiah, who will go for us? Uh, what we're going to see is that God's other name, God's sacred name, Y-H-W-H, this is a word that most Jewish people will not say out loud. It's God's most holy name. And so they have what's called a translation surrogate. It's the word Adonai. You might have heard someone say Adonai. There's a, a Jewish prayer uh, called the Shema, uh, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Um, so when you come to this word, you say the word Adonai. Well, the word Adonai is plural. It's my Lord's, plural. So it's not just the 2,000 times we have Elohim. It's the 6,000 times we have God's sacred name. When we say it out loud, we're looking at a singular word, but we're saying a plural word. And is that intended in the text? I think the New Testament would say absolutely it's intended. Uh, what else? Uh, observations, questions? Yes, tell me your name. Joshua. Joshua. So um, that, that's a great question. The, the word in Greek is the word logos. And we get the word logic from it. Um, it's the communication and the reason communication behind that. And that... Um, is connected like Jesus is God communi logically communicating to us. In Hebrew, it's the word dabar, which at times it'll say the word of the Lord appeared to someone and you think that's odd that it's using word, you know. In John's day, um, people called that the Mimra in the Aramaic. And there's one Aramaic translation of the Bible that even translates Genesis 1. Uh, in the beginning, by his Mimra, God created the world. So, like, even the Translations of the Bible uh, uh, in Aramaic are recognizing that the tension in that text and trying to come up with a way to explain it. That's a great uh, question, Joshua. Yes, tell me your name. I should know your name, but t tell me your name again. Marty. He plays with that all the time. Uh, he, Jesus said uh, in John 8, they're saying, who do you think you are? You know, you're making yourself, uh, you're saying all these things. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, and he should have said, I was, but he doesn't. He says, before Abraham was, I am and it, yeah, in Hebrew is exactly what God's name. When Moses says, what is your name? God said, it, yeah, is my name. I am who I am. I was who I was. I will be who I will be. And Jesus says, I am. And they picked up stones to stone him because they understood exactly what he was claiming to be. All right, maybe one more comment or question. Uh, if not, thank you for putting up with all the things today. If 
you were able to sign in the attendance sheet and the seating, that would be helpful, and I will see you on Friday.